So those of you that have been around on the channel for a while might remember that back in Microsoft Flight Sim 2020, we checked out an application called Lossless Scaling, an app that costs very little, around five or six pounds, I think, from Steam if memory serves, which provides its own implementation of frame generation, which can run on older GPUs that aren't eligible for today's modern native frame generation solutions. So 20 series, 30 series NVIDIA owners, this could be right up your street. As for me, I'm running today on an AMD 5800X3D CPU with a 4080 Super alongside 64 gigs of DDR4 3600CL18 memory. So there's been an update to the lossless scaling app that claims to offer 20 times the frame rate via frame generation. Yeah, you heard that right, 20 times. And I've got to be honest, I rolled my eyes immediately when I saw this. So let's put it through its paces in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2024 and see what all the fuss is about. Now, every time I bring up frame generation on the channel, the comments section becomes interesting. So it's important to understand, I think, before we start what frame generation is and what frame generation isn't. In a nutshell, frame generation will make your game appear smoother, but it won't necessarily feel smoother. Why? Well, let's say our game runs at 30 FPS without frame generation. If we now enable frame generation, the game will render a frame it will then render a second frame and hold that second frame in memory. Frame generation will then look at these two traditionally rendered frames and generate frames to go in between them. Therefore, the generated frames hold no new information from the game engine, such as the position of an enemy on screen. So if you're thinking of using frame generation in a competitive multiplayer online shooter title, for example, I wouldn't, as it's possible you might be shooting at something that isn't really there. And due to the process of holding that second real frame in memory until frame generation has played out, frame generation actually delays the new information from the game engine with that second withheld frame reaching your eyeballs. With all that said, flight simulation in my book gets a pass. It's not a twitchy first person shooter or a competitive online multiplayer title. Even during the most critical moments on short final, the motion on screen is very slow, very minimal, making it a really good candidate for frame generation. Would I prefer it to get 100 FPS without frame generation? Sure I would, but that's not where we are, so we need to be realistic. Frame generation technologies, therefore, are an area of interest for me in the context of flight simulation. You might find other slower story-based games are suitable candidates too, but put it this way, I wouldn't be playing the latest Call of Duty with frame generation on. This is all to say, don't think that using frame generation to get higher FPS is somehow going to improve your landings. If your sim is running at 30 FPS without frame generation, the inputs from your yoke, your joystick, your throttles, etc. are all being sampled at 30 times a second, regardless of the FPS figure you're seeing once frame generation has been taken into effect. Okay, so here we are in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2024 on the ground at Gatwick in our Phoenix Airbus A320. And you can see that without lossless scaling running, we're getting around 43 to 44 FPS, which honestly isn't that bad, considering this is the freeware version of Gatwick for, from FlightSim.to, albeit an updated one for 2024. Go check it out, go download it if you haven't already. So what happens if we turn on lossless scaling? To do so, we open the lossless scaling app, and on the right-hand side here, we've got our frame generation settings. Now, mine has defaulted to version 2.3 of their frame gen technology, and it's set to 2x mode, so it should double our FPS. Uh, before we go crazy and get into the new 20x mode, let's just see how this performs. So we click the scale button in the top right. We have then five seconds to click into the sim. This is how it knows to scale the FPS in the sim. And there we are, it's taken effect. Notice how the sim's built-in FPS counter on the top right there has actually taken a fall. We're now into the 30s, whereas before, without lossless scaling, we were in the 40s. But in the top left, we have some figures from the lossless scaling app. The first figure is our pre-frame generation FPS, and the second is our post-frame generation frame rate. But look how it's not actually doubling us up. It seems to be capped at 60 FPS. If we go back into the app, there's a setting called max frame latency. By increasing this number, it will allow us to render at a higher frame rate than our monitor's refresh rate. Now, being that I'm on a 60 hertz TV, I'm fairly sure this is what's keeping us capped at 60. So if we increase that to two, let's see what happens. And yeah, there we go. Much more of a doubling up of FPS now. And you can see visually 
There's not a lot wrong with it. If we go to the outside view though and pan around, pay attention to the windows on the plane as we kind of pan around real quick. Can you see those artifacts there? So that is one trade-off to keep in mind, but again, try and consider how are you actually gonna use the sim during normal use? Are you gonna be outside panning around really quick to try and see these artifacts on your windows? Probably not. Uh, so that's a trade-off you'll have to consider. Okay, what about 4X? Uh, yeah, there we have, and you can see it's running at nearly 120 FPS post-frame generation. Notice, though, how our pre-frame gen FPS is lower than when we were running at 2X. It seems that as we increase the demands on lossless scaling, it puts more pressure on our system as a whole, which brings down your pre-frame generation frame rate. Which, going back to what we were saying earlier about appearance versus feel, your sim will look smoother, but actually now your joystick inputs are being sampled at a lower rate with frame generation enabled. It's all a trade-off. My advice, play with the settings such that you get the look you're after while trying to keep your pre-frame generation FPS at or above 30 FPS. Don't be thinking you can have your sim running at 15 FPS and frame generation will magically get you to 60 and it'll be great. It won't. It will feel awful. All right, now let's go on to the new stuff. So we've been running on LSFG version 2.3. We can now use version 3.0, so let's give that a try. We'll start at 2X again and work our way up to 20X and see at what point the wheels start to fall off. And uh, we'll also revert our max frame latency back to one. And here it is, you can see we're back to being capped at 60 FPS as a result of our max frame latency being set to one. And in our outside view, even with the new 3.0 version, you can still see those artifacts on the windows. Hard to say if it's any better than 2.3, maybe, maybe it is a bit. Uh, yeah, it's hard to say. Let me know in the comments what you think. Changing the max frame latency to two and we get our doubling of FPS back versus being capped at 60. Uh, let's quickly do a takeoff roll here as I want to see how the glass cockpits look. Will they have that smeariness that we got with uh, DLSS 3 upscaling? Uh, no, it doesn't seem like we do. That actually looks quite nice and tidy. Going up to 4X gets us to 120 FPS, but again, it seems like we're now capped at 120 FPS, even though our pre-frame generation frame rate is 34. A 4X of that would get us to near like 136 FPS. So then perhaps we need to increase our maximum frame latency. Again, let's move it from 2 to 3, and yeah, there we go. We're now getting above that 120 cap. But look at our native pre-frame gen FPS. It's taken a further little dip there. Not by much, but we're now at kind of 31, 32 FPS. All right, this is what we've been waiting for. Let's go into uncharted territory. If we choose the custom uh, thing here from the drop-down menu, you can see we can go all the way to 20x frame generation. Let's start small. Let's double our 4x figure that we were just on. Let's go to 8 and yeah so again it looks like we're being capped at 180 fps due to our max frame latency being set to three if you take the 60 hertz of my monitor and multiply that by three we get 180 so it does make sense though as we're doing 8x frame generation if we take our 30 fps figure using 8x that could give us up to 240 fps if we then extrapolate that to using the 20x frame gen assuming we maintain 30 fps pre-frame gen we could be looking at 600 fps so let's change the max frame latency to 10. We'll just max it out. That will give us uh, 60 hertz of our monitor times by 10, which is 600, so we should be good. And yeah, okay, so now the 180 FPS cap is removed and we're seeing a frame rate of around 200 FPS, meaning we're seeing a pre-frame generation frame rate of around 25 FPS. As I said, anything south of 30 starts to make me uncomfortable. Uh, anyway, let's work our way up to 20, see how things go so 10x uh you know only a small difference between 8 and 10 but we'll go to 10 first gives us a pre-frame gen frame rate of around 23 fps uh, which when you 10x it gets us to around 230 15x gets us to a pre-frame gen fps of 19 or 20 so it's falling isn't it the higher we go up uh, post frame gen FPS so nice and high nearly 300 which is wild I know they're not real frames but it's still quite wild to see that especially in this title okay 
time for 20 hex let's turn it on and yeah we are nearly down to 15 fps pre-frame generation getting around 320 once frame generations had effect but look at all those visual artifacts can you see that shimmering that's going on there um su suffice to say you know as fun as it is to test this stuff i, I don't think 20 x is uh, going to be on the table it's a fun experiment that's for sure but i, I cannot cannot recommend that you use this out of curiosity then, how far do we need to drop back down to get rid of this shimmering? Now pay attention to the left edge of the screen there and also the left side of the Sims FPS counter on the right hand side of the screen. So going down to 15x, it does still seem present, although maybe, maybe slightly better. Uh, if we go to 10x, it seems better still, but it is still there. Although like the center of the screen does seem all right. It just seems like it's the, uh, the extremities. Uh, same story with 8x. If we go to 4x, it looks like it's mostly gone, but it's one of those things that once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. Uh, and crucially, at least on my system, 4x seems to keep us at around 30 FPS pre-frame generation. So this, to me, would seem like the upper end of the sensible range. So anything beyond 4, I'm not sure I can really, really recommend you go there. And I say upper end of the sensible range as even with a 4080 Super and 5800X3D with 4X enabled, coming into land at Gatwick with 4X frame generation, it felt like I quite often dipped below that 30 FPS pre-frame generation frame rate, which isn't where I'd want to be. 2X seems more stable at keeping us at or just above 30 FPS most of the way down. And given that I'm on a 60 Hertz panel, using 2X to double me up to 60 FPS seems like a sensible balance. And you know, as fun as it is to see these crazy high FPS numbers, you do have to question how useful they actually are, especially when they drive your pre-frame gen frame rates into the ground. And that's before we start talking about those visual artifacts. In, in terms of responsiveness, I found 2 and 4x okay to fly with here on short final. 2x will have less latency as there are less generated frames between each real frame. So for me, that kind of just strengthens the case for being sensible, being a bit boring and using 2x once more. Your results may vary, of course, depending on your system specifications. Maybe 4x will just be off the cards for you entirely and you'll need to use 2x anyway. In terms of quality, in visual quality, it's obviously not up to NVIDIA frame generation levels, but then it's never going to be. Like NVIDIA's frame generation integrates directly with the game engine, so it has much more context about what's going on in order to generate a higher quality result. But if you're on an older card that can't do NVIDIA's frame generation, this app gets you a lot of the way there for a very small amount of money and without you having to need to fork out for a brand new GPU. So if frame gen is something you yearn for in the sim, maybe check this one out. Thank you so much for watching, folks. Leave a comment. Let me know if you've got any questions. Let us know how you're finding lossless scaling. I'd love to hear from you. It's always interesting reading the comments. And until next time, take the very best care of yourselves. Be good to each other. And as always, happy flying.